know. Personal communications must be portable, has to be wireless. You're still there, huh? With a landline, we know when to expect being contacted. And with cellular technology, everywhere you are is fair game. So now what? You're always in touch. You're always able to be reached. You're always able to reach. Modern technology is amazing. You're subject to people calling you any place you are, any time. You can't escape from it. The mobile phone is, as well as being something we use in our work, it's also something that has an increasingly prominent role to play in our erotic life. Hello, gorgeous. What we have to remember, it's not neutral. It has a political, economic, and environmental impact on society. Originally, you would speak into the telephone, it would generate a signal that was your speech, and that would go over a pair of wires through maybe a couple of switches and things like that to the telephone at the other end where the electrical signal would activate the equivalent of a loudspeaker and people would hear. You know, this has been really fun, but now you're wasting my minutes. I'm gonna go. People are fundamentally, basically, inherently mobile. From the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to sleep at night, you're moving, you want to be where the action is. And all the telephone did for 100 years was chain you to your desk, lock you into the house. What we did with cellular was just change all that. AT&T uh, invented this concept of cellular uh, back in the 1940s, and they put it away in a drawer at, at Bell Laboratories. And then in the late 60s, engineers dug this thing up and decided they were going to create a new kind of communications, car telephones. I, at that time, was with Motorola. Yeah, we were already building portable telephones for police and airport people. And we knew that you could have a portable cellular telephone. To demonstrate that we knew how to do this, we actually created the world's first cellular telephone. This telephone, I must tell you, is nothing like this phones that we use today. Now, this phone weighs uh, four ounces. The first cellular telephone weighed uh, 40 ounces, but it worked. It made phone calls. The first cell phone that I ever saw was a gigantic brick. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that before. One of the first things that struck me was just the impossibility of being able to be connected wherever you are. I mean, it sounded like something out of a James Bond film or out of Star Trek. Now, the first public call I made on the streets of New York in April of 1973 took another 10 years for us to turn this demonstration into something real. And in 1983, the first service actually appeared. Why do we call it cellular? Uh, if you look around the city, there are many towers. In the old days, you'd put up one big tower in the city and you could hold one conversation on a radio channel. Well, that worked very well, except what if you had a bunch of people wanted to talk? They had to wait till the other person finished. And cellular solved that problem. And the way it solved that problem is you put up a lot of towers in the city. And you'd had a conversation in one part of the city on a radio channel. And then someplace in another part of the city, you could use that same radio channel over again. And so theoretically, you could have 10 or 20 or 100 conversations on one radio channel. And they would not interfere with each other because they each one operated in a small area, a small cell. And that's how cellular worked. You could now move from one part of the city to another. And as you move from one of these cells to another, we would continue the conversation. We call that a handover. It's happening literally continuously. Probably uh, every 30 seconds or so, you're actually jumping from one channel to another, but you don't hear a thing. You have no awareness of this. Within five or six years, the number of people in the United States that had these phones, it got up into the hundreds of thousands and we reached a million you know, in six or seven years. Today, there are a billion people in the world uh, that are all using portable telephones of this kind. Bring it! The ability to take a phone that's normally in New York with a New York telephone number, take it to Chicago, 
have somebody anywhere in the United States dial that New York telephone number with the New York area code, and within a second, the phone in Chicago rings. I mean, those were the things that were important to us. My first reaction was, why would somebody need something like that? I'm a police officer. I need paramedics. It started to be used as a consumer product by people who observed it being used in business. Just think about the fact that a real estate agent has to look at new houses all the time, and yet they also have to be available when a client calls. And they are among the first people that started to use uh, cellular telephones. As the price went down, it turns out that even teenagers today can't conduct their social lives and can't keep in touch with their parents unless they've got their cellular phones. Young people always play an important role in helping to shape the adoption of a technology. They're not afraid to test the boundaries of something. Kids are always trying to break things, so that's what they did with cell phones too. In the same way that Citizens Band Radio exploded, if you remember a few years ago, in the same way that the internet has exploded, it seems to me that if you give people an ability to expand their communication capability, they're going to seize it. Can I get the phone? Hold on a second. I'm emailing this video to my computer. It's going to be my new screen saving. So it really is the practical issues that make things grow. It is the social need that makes something grow and the ability of technology to respond to that need. We've had a major revolution in the economic uh, underpinnings of our society without any discussion of it. And it's basically that need is now being created. We are told what we need, and we're told that we won't be part of the cutting edge. We won't be part of the emerging progress of civilization unless we own this computer or cell phone or whatever the gadget might be. <laughs> that was gonna give me that goddamn charger! If the person has a phone in their pocket, it's burning a hole in their pocket, they've got to use it. And they make a lot of telephone calls that they otherwise wouldn't have made, didn't need to make. Their lives would be no different if they hadn't made them, and yet they're making them. I was in a bank line uh, recently, and the, and the woman in front of me was talking on her cell phone. She said, I don't know who she was talking to, her mother or boyfriend. Well, I've now left the drugstore, and I'm in the bank. <laughs> And then she said, and I'm leaving the bank and then I'm going to go to the pet store. It was like every step of her way was being reported. You can't walk down the street without seeing people using their cellular telephone, no matter where you are. You come out of the shopping mall and go to the parking lot and people standing there using their phones. Or inside the store, they're using their phones. In restaurants, they're using their phones. I'm amazed that people don't value their privacy a little bit more. The thing that I like most about watching with cell phones is listening to the content of the conversations. And that is abysmal. The trivial level of conversation that's going on on most of these cell phones. What once was basically a telephone has now become an entertainment center. Now you take photographs, you connect wirelessly to your computer, it has uh, games that you can play. It's no longer a telephone, it has little to do with communication, it has to do with entertainment. Kids are using uh, wireless technology in ways that we might not have expected. We hear about teenagers sending dozens of text messages. They might send text messages every few minutes if they're just thinking about each other. This might seem funny to us, uh, to, to people who are a little bit older and who aren't part of that age group, because we think about that as not being a real conversation. We think about that as being sort of a distant way for two people to communicate with each other. But there's something beautiful about the fact that people can communicate with each other as if they're in the same room. It's a way of creating digital presence. A text message, you'd think, is not something which would carry a great deal of kind of emotional or erotic charge. But um, again and again, respondents would talk about how they would get very excited and turned on by text messages sent from either their partners or from people that they wanted to get to know. They were very excited about how the mobile phone allowed them to be a lot more forward, a lot more upfront about their sexual fantasies the kind of sexual persona that they could develop through text messaging, protected by the anonymity that the phone afforded them, was actually sometimes a great deal more confident and predatory than they themselves were. Sorry to interrupt, have you guys seen these new phones? Camera phones are an area of particular interest for me. The first time that I saw one of these devices, I was blown away. I mean, the images that they produce are crude, they're pixelated, 
they're tiny. They're like the size of a postage stamp compared to what comparably priced digital cameras can produce. But the idea that we have devices now that give us the ability to capture an image, save an image, and share it with anyone in the world. You can publish this online and potentially millions of people could be seeing that image five minutes later. That's a pretty amazing concept. Technology for the last 500 years has been something that has been foisted upon us many times with over-exaggerated claims of its benefits to our lives. And we kind of passively and many times unconsciously just accept it until it becomes an integral part of our lives. And then we begin to see the consequences of what that technology does for us. There's no peace anymore. There's no peace and quiet and contentment and, and, and chance to think. The, the fax machine took a lot of that away also. There's no time anymore to, uh, to think things over. Everything's immediate, everything's quick. I got what you're looking for. Oh. I think the most important thing about the mobile phone is it um, subtly but dramatically has refigured the way in which we experience solitude. We are the first generation who will never have available to us, whether for good or for bad, the opportunity for solitude and isolation, which was celebrated but also suffered by um, previous generations. So the capacity to be alone is something which, if we value it, we've lost, and if we hate it, we've escaped from. If you have just constant distractions and, and the, the sort of constant ability to be contacted or to have your attention compromised, what kind of quality of interaction do you have with the people that you're supposed to be paying attention to? For hundreds of thousands of years, we communicated by uh, visually seeing each other. And part of that communication was body language, how you shook your head, how your eyes were operating. We have an evolutionary history that involves communication between us face to face. In other words, within a natural environment. What's happened within the last hundred years, it's taken it out of that natural environment and put it into something artificial. The phone has become an intimate part of not just our everyday practical lives, but an intimate part of our emotional life. It no longer makes sense to have a relationship, to fall in love, to fall out of love to be with somebody, to flirt with somebody, to leave somebody without thinking about um, the mediation of the mobile phone in that process. On the telephone, generally speaking, you're talking about wanting to get your message or information across. There might be a little chit chat, but then it's over. If we're together, it's a much different process, slower, more immediate. The mobile phone is not just a passive conduit through which love relationships take place, it's also a kind of contributory character in the kind of unfolding of a love relationship, you know, from the beginning to the middle to the end. Actually, no, you're gonna need help uh, when you pull my subpoena out of your asshole for not getting off my line. It doesn't take a cellular phone to make people rude, because people are rude in other ways as well, and we have to develop a whole new code of courtesy for cell phones. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. If you're in a restaurant, people on all sides of you are talking on the cell phone. If you're in traffic, people on all sides of you. Uh, if you're in the men's room, the guy standing at the next urinal is on the cell phone while he's standing there. I mean, it's amazing. I don't want people keeping tabs on me all day and night, and I don't want to be reached all the time. Hey! Get off your cell phone! Concentrate on the road! Driving with cell phone, uh, this has been one of the most controversial issues that's come up with cell phone technology in the past few years. We've had um, bans in different states throughout the country. State governments have decided in, in different areas that it's not okay for people to be driving while talking on the cell phone. There's also been a backlash from the other side where people are saying, look, we've got plenty of laws already. The last thing we need is government telling us uh, it's okay to be fiddling around with your CD player and completely distracted, but it's not okay to take a call from your child at home. The opportunities for freedom, for connectedness, for security, these are all definite positives. The other downside the chatter, the interruption, the disruption of social space, the uh, invasions of privacy, the exposure to other people's private lives, whether we like it or not. All of that is a cost which, on balance, I think it is worth paying. I don't think that cellular technology presents any greater of a privacy challenge than any other kind of digital technology that we have today. Again and again, we have to debate how much control 
we have over our digital identities. Increasingly, it will be possible to track people. So, for example, somebody lost in a wilderness will nevertheless be able to be tracked and found by emergency services through their mobile phone. However, some users are not reassured by it because they feel that the capacity to know where they are and where they've been is an infringement of their right to privacy. There are different technologies, cellular jamming technologies, that can be used to disable cell phones within a certain vicinity. And for the most part in America, they're illegal. The federal government might want to use this technology to disable cell phones, let's say if there were a bomb threat, and we know that bombs can be triggered by cell phones. Every technology going all the way back can be used for good or it can be overused and abused. And if you've got a government that is inclined to be big brotherish, they'll use the technology that way, and if they're not, they won't. You know, the technology is uh, amoral. When there's a crisis, like an earthquake or a fire or something that happened like 9-11, wireless is the only way to do it because telephone exchanges crash, they break, they burn, and the cellular system is inherently more reliable because there are lots of cell sites. You break a bunch of them, there are a bunch of them around there that will still be working, and each one of those can be battery operated, and in general are, so that even though the system breaks down, they still keep operating and still keep delivering information to us. I think we can imagine a day not too far off from now when wireless technology is the standard and wired technology uh, feels as ancient as telegraphs. Mobile phones of the future will effectively be an aggregation of a number of contemporary technologies. For example, personal digital assistance will be part of a mobile phone. Our laptop computer will be part of our mobile phone. Our TV remote control will be part of our mobile phone. One way of thinking about the mobile phone of the future is to say that it will become the object into which all other technologies have been absorbed. The way that we communicate with machines uh, today is very, very awkward. The fact that you've got to use a keyboard slows you down. At some point, uh, you'll have the phone behind your ear. I think it ought to be uh, under your skin. Uh, and when you want to make a phone call, you just think about it. You just think of a phone number, you think of a person, you think of a digital location, and you're able to communicate with that person or that place or that batch of information. They really will become cellular. This is something that's going to become embedded technology, something that is part of us biologically. To tell you the truth, I, I wish that time were here now. A community of people who have so much knowledge at their fingertips will develop at the same time a greater capacity to synthesize, integrate and process that knowledge. Each of us will be assigned a digital identity from birth. Thinking of individuals as numerically identifiable beings, it's already happened. What we do with that and the kind of sovereignty we allow ourselves over our information those are discussions that are going to continue for a long time. It's incumbent upon us not just to think about how does this benefit me personally, but we need to have a more holistic understanding of it. And the question should be, who is benefiting from this technology and what impact is it having on our society?